So I'm going to begin our discussion today with some research from neuroscience and child psychology. And as economists that have been looking at issues around labor economics and workforce development, our eye in the past 10 to 15 years has really turned to this research around understanding how the brain develops and the implications these early years have on the ability for kids to learn in school, succeed in school, graduate from high school, and be successful in the workforce. In two weeks from now, you have Judy Cameron, who I, I'll plug her talk. She has done amazing research in neuroscience to help describe how the brain forms and the impact that environments have on the development of young children. So I'm going to be brief about um, my part of this discussion because we'll get a lot more information in two weeks. This is a slide uh, from Harvard University at the Center on the Developing Child. It's a conceptual slide. It's basically here to show you that during the first year of life, the parts of the brain that regulate language and sensory pathways are peaking in their development during the first year of life. During the first couple years of life, the parts of the brain that regulate higher cognitive functioning are peaking in their development. That is, the connections that are formed in the brain are proliferating at a very fast rate. In a given second, anywhere from 7 to 100 to 1,000 connections are formed per second during the first few years of life. Then after this, we can look at pictures uh, like this one. The brain starts to become more efficient relative to the environment in which the child is growing up. So the connections that are formed early uh, and reinforced early will stay while the brain will start to prune those connections that were not reinforced early so that it can become efficient and ready for the rest of that, that child's life. So when a child is growing up with support at home, uh, with parents, uh, where that child is hearing lots of vocabulary words, where there are encouraging interactions for that child to explore the environment, the opportunity to socialize with other children, to explore the community, that this is a child who is likely to arrive at kindergarten prepared to succeed in school. However, if children are subject to excessive adversity, that brain is going to set itself for an environment that is going to be expecting neglect or threat. For example, if a child is exposed to abuse uh, while growing up or neglect while growing up, if there is household dysfunction in that child's uh, growing up, such as the stresses of living in poverty, uh, if a, one of the parents is wrestling with chemical abuse or mental health issues, or is incarcerated. These are all conditions that are considered to be excessively uh, stressful uh, for that brain. And that brain is going to be able, it's going to set itself uh, relative to those conditions. So when a child comes to kindergarten and has had excessive adversity, the parts of the brain that regulate memory and learning have been set back because of this early stress. The, what we notice uh, with the achievement gap between children who come from uh, more socioeconomically advantaged households relative to children who are coming from more disadvantaged households is the achievement gap that we talk about in our school systems is observed at kindergarten and that it tends to widen uh, during the elementary grades and into middle school. That is, the, the issues of the achievement gap are starting very early. And one of the widely cited uh, pieces of research that was conducted in the 1990s uh, where researchers went into the homes and they interviewed, and they, they basically took in video cameras and were able to look and record the number of vocabulary words that children were hearing and the type of interactions that they were having with their parents. And they found that by the age of three, children who had college-educated parents had twice the vocabulary as children who were growing up in poverty. By the age of four, children with college-educated parents were hearing 30 million more words uh, than children who were growing up in poverty. And also the type of interactions tended to be more positive, that they were encouraging their children to explore their environment. There was less percentage that were punitive, where the reverse was noted for those children who were growing up in poverty. And, and, yes? When you use the term welfare parents, it comes up as being very pejorative. I would encourage you to change the language on that slide. 
The welfare welfare periods? Yep. Yeah, this is I apologize it's, it's for very, very, very that's very, very, that really strikes me. Yeah, very low income is what it should be. Okay. So uh, the adverse childhood experiences study is also a study that looks at the the impact of adversity on long-term health issues. So this study was conducted in Southern California uh, by Kaiser Permanente Health System. They interviewed 17,000 adults about their early childhood experiences, and they categorized them into potentially one of to 10 different types of categories <coughs> of early abuse or neglect or hostile dysfunction. And then they simply looked at the correlations between their, the impact of their health, the relative health relative to the number of these early adverse experiences. And they found that once an adult is categorized with more than six of these ACEs, as they're called, they're three times more likely to be suffering from heart disease. And the researchers see the same correlations between uh, the ACEs and also mental health and addiction, and the substance abuse and alcoholism. So the, the brain and the body is impacted by these early experiences, and the effects are lifelong. And Judy Cameron will describe even further how this, this process works. So our research then at the Minneapolis Fed turned to looking at interventions that have an impact on young children, particularly those from more disadvantaged environments. So I'm going to talk briefly about some research studies, long-term research studies that look at the impact of high-quality preschool, high-quality education, rich child care programs, and home visiting. Uh, so before I begin, how many have heard of the, the Perry Preschool Study? So the, the Perry Preschool Study is a widely cited study. And I also, I just want to pause for a moment. When I get to the end of this presentation, I encourage you just to ask any questions you have on your mind about the research. You know, anything that you've come to this room that you want to ask about, uh, you know, I'm here to do my best to answer your questions. So the Perry Preschool Study was conducted in Ypsilanti, Michigan, uh, outside of Detroit, a socioeconomically distressed uh, community back in the 1960s. And the, the special education uh, director of the Ypsilanti School District wanted to see what impact offering preschool would have on special education requirements among children and placement once those children got to school. So they were able to partner with the High School Foundation and back then conduct a randomized trial uh, which doesn't happen often in social science where we can do this uh, randomized, randomizing, you know, and then be able to watch children over a long time horizon. So the children who attended Perry had a high quality half day preschool program for two years and the teachers visited the homes of those children to reinforce the lessons learned in that classroom environment um, back in the, the home setting. So they're able to track these two groups of children over a long period of time. First, the educational effects. They found achievement scores were higher. Graduation rates were higher, a 65% graduation rate compared to 45%. Of course, we want that 65% to be higher, um, but it's a notable difference between these two groups of children. And indeed, there was a reduction in the need for special education. There are a number of economic uh, effects and differences between the children who attended Perry and the control group at the age of 40. So home ownership rates were higher among the Perry graduates. Earnings in the workforce were higher as well. And coming from the Federal Reserve, I included this statistic, they're more likely to have a savings account at a bank. The crime rates, all different types of crime, from felonies to misdemeanors, were essentially cut in half. And this is where we find the largest public benefits to this particular uh, intervention. So now we conduct a cost-benefit analysis, and we bring in the economists, they add up the cost of the program, in today's dollars on an annual basis that cost about $12,000 per child. In the study, the children attended for over a year and a half on average. We then see savings to the K-12 system due to reductions in special education. Then there are higher participant earnings. Most of this is a private benefit going to the children once they get to the workforce but some comes back to the public in the form of higher tax revenue. Then we see the savings to the reduced need for the criminal justice system. And this includes 
uh, less need for police protection, incarceration costs are lower, and also court costs. And then there's reductions to the estimated cost to the victims of crime. So adding up all of these benefits relative to cost, it's a very high ratio of benefits to cost, up to $16 for every dollar returned. At the Federal Reserve Bank, our Rolick and I uh, estimated an annual rate of return uh, based on the data. And we estimate that an inflation adjusted annual rate of return every year over the lifetime of these benefits, so going up into the early 60s, averages 18% total. Uh, because most of the benefit is accruing to the non participant, we estimate that public uh, rate at 16%. Now, all of these data have been reanalyzed by James Heckman. He's a, a Nobel laureate economist at the University of Chicago. He makes some more conservative assumptions about how to calculate the crime benefit, but still has a very high rate of return of 10%. Now, I'll mention briefly three other studies uh, that have been conducted. The Abbasidarian Educational Child Care Program is an educationally enriched child care program in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. And this study was conducted in the 1970s. And here children received a high quality experience starting just a few months of age to kindergarten, included parent education at the center as well. They found benefits for kids once they were in their school system. They were, had lower grade retention, lower special education, and they were three times more likely to go to college as an adult. The Chicago Child Parent Center project is a large-scale project in Chicago, reaching hundreds of children each year. It includes parent education, two years of preschool, half day, uh, for three and four year olds. Uh, here they found benefits quite similar to the Perry study. And then different than a center-based uh, project, a home visiting program, uh, where a registered nurse counsels an at-risk expected mother uh, during pregnancy, through the birth process, until the child reaches the age of two. And they found that this intervention, this home visiting intervention, was able to stabilize the family economically. Uh, the children were, had safer home environments. They were less likely to be committing crime by the time they were adolescents. So there were a number of savings as well. Now, some of the benefits uh, to these projects are private. They go to the families and to the children. Uh, but the majority of benefits across these four projects go to the non-participants, to the public. And so all these ratios, of course, are over one. So it means you're, you're getting your positive return. Rates of return range uh, anywhere from 7 to 10 percent up to nearing 20 percent annually. Uh, but as I said, most of the benefits accrue to the non-participants, to the public, or to the taxpayer. So this means you don't even have to like children to achieve this high rate of return. You, know, you, can, be, you can be Scrooge you know, before his enlightenment in the Christmas Carol and achieve a strong rate of return. It's, uh, there, there is a, a benefit a return that is made. I'll just mention this slide uh, briefly because I'm, I'm showing you long-term studies. You know, studies that were started back in the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s. And just to mention that there are a number of studies of state preschool programs that have been able to establish that children do benefit across a wide range of backgrounds and income backgrounds for families in terms of their cognitive and their social emotional skills going into uh, kindergarten. Head Start has been, and early Head Start has been analyzed with randomized trials. These studies do show that children improve uh, during their time in these programs. The long-term Head Start study did find by third grade, uh, children looked quite similar uh, from the control group relative to the kids who were in Head Start. And so for any of you who have heard the word, you know, fade out, you know, that is the concern that you make these early investments, and by the time children reach third grade, the benefits have faded out. And so uh, folks who are concerned about fade out sometimes turn to the study and, uh, and point out that we need to be concerned that we are continuing these benefits. You know, once kids reach kindergarten, they're going to high quality uh, program there. There's some continuity between our early learning system and our K through 12 system. It's also noteworthy though in the Head Start study that it's much more of a catch up than it is a fade up. That is when kids come to our kindergartners behind, what happens in that classroom? Well, they get some more attention. 
from the teacher of the school is trying to help them catch up. In the case of the Head Start study, we see that both the scores of the kids who had attended Head Start and in the control group are increasing as the control group is now catching up with those kids who are attending Head Start. Another study that was uh, released um, over the past couple of years is the Tennessee Pre-K program, which also brought concerns about this fade out issue because they found with the randomized trial by third grade, kids were looking quite similar, those who were in their pre-K program and those who were in the control group. So you can imagine what the Tennessee legislature did once they got the report of that study with their pre-K program, right? Did they make cuts? They did make cuts, but what they did is they passed some legislation to address some of the quality issues that they had concerns with in the study. The researchers noted that the pre-K program itself was not achieving some of the quality level uh, that you would expect to have in order to have the long-term results, like we see in the Prairie study, the Abyssinarian study, or the, child, the Chicago Child Parent Center project. Uh, so addressing quality is very important and continuity uh, for kids going into our K-12 system from our early learning system. Uh, the third bullet shows the Infant Health and Development Program, which is modeled after the Addison-Marion Project. An analysis uh, from the University of Minnesota shows that the kids uh, who are in this program, the lower income kids relative to the higher income kids, by the age of three, the achievement gap was gone. So all of the neurobiology that we talked about at the beginning of our session, this intervention was able to close that achievement gap over this two year period. Um, by the time you get to age 18, you know, of course, kids are, are influenced by other factors. Uh, the achievement gap was, was not fully closed, but at least half of it to a third uh, was still closed that much by the time kids reached 18. And then finally, Michigan, uh, which has a targeted uh, state preschool program in the public school system, has been able to show higher graduation rates over time. So there are a number of long-term benefits, but there's also short-term benefits. For our home visiting programs, and you have one here in Maine, uh, parents as teachers have been able to show that you can improve birth outcomes, uh, make family home environments safer, uh, reduce child abuse and neglect is also one of the objectives of home visiting programs, as well as, as this was a result that was found in the Child Parent Center project. Reducing grade retention and special education are cost savings that can be improved quite early in our public budgets. And having a high quality child care system can help reduce absenteeism and improve productivity in the workplace. So companies are concerned about the availability of child care. Child care does allow parents to choose to enter the workforce when they're at their job, if their child care arrangements are taken care of, uh, they're less likely to be worried about those arrangements or have to leave work to have to deal with a situation that fell through the cracks. And as, as you know, in Maine, there's over two-thirds of children under the age of six have all of their parents in the workforce. So where children are during the day while parents are at work, child development is happening. So child development is always happening and the types of environments which those children are in is going to determine what type of connections and what happens with that development. So finally, what are some of the key lessons learned from this research? And as you make investments in early learning going forward, the importance of investing in quality. This is the qualifications and skills of teachers. In center-based programs, the relatively low ratios of children to teachers and using a research-backed curriculum and approach. Involving parents is very crucial for the success of these programs. They're not replacing the job of parents, but in many ways supporting and helping parents become better parents. Even programs, let's say the Abyssinarian Project, uh, where children were attending for 40 hours or more per week, those programs are connecting with parents, making sure they're understanding what is happening, um, in that program, what's happening in terms of child development milestones for their children, and so that, that can, they can support their children not only during their early years, but once they go into the school system. And starting early, so our continuum of investments can be as early as prenatal, uh, for example, through home visiting, 
And reaching vulnerable children and families is where you'll achieve the highest rate of return. This is where prevention dollars will have the strongest impact and on the margin have the, the largest influence. Remedial programs are still important, but researchers recognize that they're more expensive and less effective once children get older. And the importance of bringing this research to scale. There are many children who are on waiting lists, let's say for child care subsidies, for Head Start centers, and the opportunity to promote a high quality early learning program. And so there's a lot of room to go to reach those, what in Minnesota our business leaders call our, our high return children, those vulnerable children. And then finally, uh, as we've been talking you know, so far, outlining what is the continuum of investments that states make and that Maine is making in early learning. So home visiting uh, through the parents as teachers model, as mentioned here in the state. Preschool, uh, looking at the program that you're running through your preschool system at, at this time. And quality childcare, so using the state's quality rating system to help improve the quality of child care programs and also giving parents information about how to shop for quality and for the types of questions you want your parents to be asking about the child care conditions at the places that they're looking at. Uh, parent education, whether that is happening at a home visiting program or through a classroom-based program. And connecting the child welfare system uh, to our early learning programs. So children who are perhaps our most vulnerable, those who are in child protection, or in foster care, that we are making sure that there are linkages to those kids to early learning programs and also important mental health interventions. And then finally, that kids have access to health care. They're on our, our health care insurance roles and that they have a consistent uh, primary care provider. So these are the, the continuum of investments that we, we see have an impact on development and that there's research behind to suggest or clearly show that there are cost savings to government in the long run, but also in the short run. I'm going to leave you uh, with a picture. And so this is a picture of a marshmallow. So why would I show a picture of a marshmallow at the end of a, a talk about early learning? The marshmallow test. Yeah, so the marshmallow test. What happens in the marshmallow test? So we have Walter Mitchell, uh, he's a Stanford University conducts this research for the first time. It's been replicated many times since. So you have a researcher and a young child, four-year-old, and the researcher offers that child a treat, like a marshmallow, and then says, okay, I'm going to be back in 15 minutes, and if there is a marshmallow, uh, if there is a marshmallow there, uh, you, I'll give you another one. Um, and if it's not, you know, hope you enjoy the marshmallow. You're not going to get another one. And so the researcher leaves, and then everyone else is behind one of those glass mirrors, and they can watch the child and to see what the child does. And some children reach out, grab the marshmallow, and eat it right away. And then some other children, they, they have some strategies to distract themselves, kind of keep the image of that marshmallow at bay, look around the room, hum to themselves, and so on. And researchers began to find that there's some correlation between children who ate the marshmallow versus those who waited and got that second marshmallow, and outcomes in school. The kids who waited uh, tended to do better in school. But what, what part of the brain is functioning here? It's part of the brain called the executive function in the brain. Within the executive function, it's the ability to self-regulate, to hold a uh, thought, and be able to work on something else at the same time, to be able to not be distracted, by other things that are happening around in your environment. So it's that, it's that control center within the, the brain. And what they found is that kids that did delay that gratification, they did better in school, they were less likely to be obese, and there were some positive adult outcomes as well. So I'm putting up this image of the marshmallow because in some ways, investing in early childhood is like a societal marshmallow test. Because it takes some money to make these investments, right? You have, you're increasing taxes to pay this, or you're not, and you're shifting priorities within your public budgets, or from philanthropy, uh, philanthropy is putting their own money, or from our own philanthropic dollars as individuals, we're putting resources into these programs. Um, so, 
So there is some sacrifice in the beginning. Uh, but what the research shows that if we do make this investment now, that in the future, there will be many more marshmallows uh, down the road for everyone to put on their sticks and roast over the fire. Which is an analogy I can do in Maine. <laughs> we are all there camping, right? <laughs>